If you have your Bibles, I hope you do. Let's turn the Word of God to Genesis 1, 26 to 2, 24. I, I will read it, but if you, if you can follow along, I am reading from ESV. Hear now the Word of the Lord. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over all the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, behold, I've given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, and everything that has breath, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And the Lord God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And then there was evening, and then there was morning, the sixth day. Thus, the heavens and the earth were finished and all the hosts of them. And on the seventh day, God had finished his work that he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day. He made it holy because on it, God rested all his work that he had done in creation. Here we go. So we're going to look. So the plan is we're going to look at Genesis 1, 26 to 31. Then we'll work at Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. Before we get into looking at these specific passages, I just I want to talk structure briefly. When we look at the structure of Genesis 1 and 2, so we're looking at Genesis 1 and 2, there's really two accounts going on, and how do we view those? So a liberal would say, ah, there's a mistake. Clearly, there's a mistake. There are two different his uh, origins stories, and so one of them is wrong. Okay, that's that's how a liberal would approach this, and I strongly disagree with that. The position I take is that Genesis one is is an overview, or the the big picture of what's happening, the big picture, or the the theological picture. And then Genesis 2, now really I think it begins in like Genesis 2-5. Okay, so in fairness, okay, I'm just looking at big pictures, but really it would it would not begin in Genesis 2-1, it would begin in Genesis 2-5. And then Genesis 2-5, pretty much the all of Genesis 2 is looking at the details. Now when I say that, I am not saying that one or the other is not literal. Okay. I take a I take a very I take a young earth view. I'm in the minority now with evangelical scholars. In fairness, I'm not an old testament. I my 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 area of expertise is New Testament, but I would I would strongly disagree with with it not being literal from 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 Hebrew, the Hebrew language. And and it would that's just beyond the scope of this class. Suffice it to say, if you look over here to the left at this text, the reason for strongly affirming this is that at the conclusion of the sixth day, God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. The evening and the morning were the sixth day. So number one, everything is good. Number two, if you come back up here, God creates man and female in his image. So God creates male and female in his image, and He everything is good, okay? And then when you go down to, to chapter 2, 18, the Lord says it's not good for man to be alone. 99.9999999% Genesis 2 is unpacking the events of the day of the sixth day. Okay. And so then after he causes the deep sleep, then you have the conclusion. Therefore shall man leave his father and his mother, hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. The, the, the man, the woman were not ashamed. Okay. And so then the, that's that c concludes day six. God rests on day seven, and then if you were to look at Genesis three, that's probably day eight. Okay, that's how I would see that. 
So I would say that up and up through the whole first week of creation, up until the end when God rested, everything was perfect and good. I think that's a very fair assessment. So if, if that's the case, really what's going on here is if you can imagine uh, Genesis 1 is big, the big picture, and then Genesis 2 is the the details, especially uh, the sixth day. Any comments or questions before we move on? Is that making sense? So let's 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 go ahead. Let's look here. So um, just identifying, we're always looking at actors, objects, and actions, and then we're looking at re- other words that describe those actions. Okay, so that's pretty much what we're looking at. Later, I'll have a handout for that. So the first thing I see here is, of course, this uh, this is God. God is the actor, and here, God is doing the action of speaking. And so uh, looking at this big idea here, I'd say that this is probably some form of a, of a, of a declaration that's going on here. When you see the language of, of God speaking in Genesis one, this is a verb and the noun form for speak would be speech or word. And from John 1, 1, that's Jesus. Whenever you see God said, God said, God said, imagine the means by which he's saying is the son, is, is, is the word himself, okay? So that is something so fundamental for us to, to understand. So Jesus is present here in the creation of the word. And actually, we have a video on our Christology course that really unpacks John John 1 1 to 5. So in this in this passage we're looking we're looking at Genesis moving forward. But in but in our discussion in John, we're in John 1 1 to 5 looking back, reflecting upon back on the creation act. So so um check out that video. It's the I think it's the eternal word, the eternal word, the second session in Christology, if you want to see more details there. Okay, so we have this this God, he's he's speaking. And and so the action that he's speaking is he is making an int- what we would refer to as an entreaty here, an entreaty. He's saying, let us make. Okay. So the us is the actor. Let's ask from the um breakout session questions. Did you discuss this? this uh, word here did anyone discuss that maybe you can maybe you can share your your commentary on this we saw it as a reference to god's uh, trinitarian nature book so let's write this down here so there's there's a plurality there right and so you're saying that this is a, a tr- trinity a trinitarian reference right and this is the persons okay so Great. Anyone else make comments? Anyone else make discussions? Anyone do like a a study to see if this is, that's what's going on. Anyone else have a comment to make? Okay, good. Now here's the thing. People will, so, so the gray area here is, so just to be clear, because maybe if you were to say something like this to a Jehovah's witness, they would give you a pushback. There is a little bit of a gray area and we, there's not a problem here, but they would, some uh, scholars would say the us goes back to God and God is really in is uh, um, Elohim. And so this is just plural for majesty. And so they'll just say the plural is not referring to the three persons of the Trinity. It's just referring to God, which is Elohim, which is plural. And so in one sense, they are correct, grammatically speaking, because Elohim is plural. But even that word Elohim, it's it's, it's plural. It implies more than one in some sense. Okay. So they would just say it's it's the fullness of majesty, this is where there's a there is a gray area, okay? And so do we assume the scripture is inspired and and it informs us how we ought to interpret it or do we accept liberal humanistic enlightenment autonomous wisdom of of man? And so if we're coming from a from a high view of scripture and what the scripture reveals later uh, the scripture reveals later that that there is a trinitarian god 
once we once we see that revelation, we're like, ah, that makes sense why he would speak in the plural. Okay. And so this is not a, a foreground, this is a background type uh description of the Trinity. Okay. If all we had is this, we we couldn't say it's the Trinity. But because we're uh so let's just draw this is this is a, a big picture going on here. Revelation. And I'm going to make a more general term because it is more than just it is more than just redemption. So it's revelation, uh, God's work and redemption. Okay, so and you'll see why in a moment. So these two are in are inseparable. So if you can imagine, it's like a chain. The big takeaway is that. If revelation is inseparable from God's work and redemption, so this is this is word and this is deed. The word explains the deeds and the deeds confirm the word. So these two are inseparable. And so if we if we understand and accept that, there's there's there is a, a firm chain between the two that they're inseparable that absolutely strengthens and solidifies our interpretation here. But at this point here, the meaning is in the background. Okay. Th this is in the background. It's not overt. Is everyone tracking there with me? But it's present nonetheless. And the reason why I'm saying this, and the reason why I'm bringing this in is because maybe you'd say, Tim, that's so deep. Why are you sharing with that? Because if you were to bring this in as an argument with the Jehovah's Witnesses, that's how they would respond. They would say Elohim's just majesty, and it's not. It's not Trinitary. You you just you don't know Hebrew language, okay? And so I'm trying to I'm trying to bring in additional proofs to to strengthen the, the Trinitarian uh, flavor that's going on here in in the background. Is is everyone tracking? Let me take a pause. I want to make sure everyone's tracking with that form of argumentation. The and ask to, there is a personal pronoun, right? Yes, in Hebrew, because because Elohim Elohim is plural. The antecedents, they're just matching because of the, the plural. Do, do, do you understand what I'm saying? Example in Tagalog, okay? Uh, when you're when you're speaking um, for reverence or for respect, sometimes you'll use the plural for respect, right? You won't say... The word kami. Yeah, kami. You will not say... You, you will say kami or you will say... You will, you will say... What's the example? If you're speaking uh, res respectfully, you, you, won't, you won't use sha or you won't use... Oh, you use kayo, right? You'll use kayo. You'll use kayo. You you won't use ka. Diba for respect sometimes, even if you're speaking to one person. Tamaba, is that is that correct? Yes. I I somehow get what, what is your point using the uh, plural, but you, you will not use the singular. But but in in all of the old testament, when you talk about the Elohim, yeah. Um it it is not just simply describing the, the majesty of God, or we're saying the majestic. Yeah, we don't yeah. stop there. We we are always referring it to a to a person. Yeah, um, to God as a person, not just not just uh, an adjective to a to a God's adjective or God's description. We're not talking. We're talking about the person of God every time yeah. Elohim is yeah. being used. I agree with you a hundred percent, Enting. I guess from I'm just trying to say is that from a grammatical perspective. The response from a non-believer or a cult would just say, "No, the name for God here is just Elohim. It's a plural of Majesty, but it's still one person." Do you see what I'm saying? So, so that's that's the pushback. Yeah. So I agree with you. I I'm with you 100. percent What you're saying is, I would actually refer you use Enting's argument as well that Elohim really has this fuller meaning beyond just what they're saying. Absolutely. But yeah. Uh, <laughs> We're there. We're there. Really good, really good uh comments. Excellent. Um, but but yeah, so just to be clear, it it it, it is a twisting of of grammar, like like Brendan Brendan was saying, but we have to be knowledgeable there. So um I say all that to say Elohim and even that fullness of majesty, it's like it's personal and it and it really it's really when once you have the new testament, like, oh Elohim is probably referred to the Trinity. <laughs> No, and and there is that there is that I aspect later on, right? I am the Lord. You will not do this. I am the Lord. But here it's not. You're getting at that deeper truth that's there in the context, but it's not overt until we have 
the coming of Christ that really shines the light on what was there in the past. Excellent. Really good. Okay, let's move on here. Let's let's look at this here now. The object is man. The Trinity is going to make man. And then we're looking here at this is a comparison or a blueprint. He's making man in our image after our likeness. Okay. And so the question is, <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> right? What does it mean to have our image, our likeness? It's been so debated, right? Let's put a pause on that because I think let's look at the, the subsequent statement of what man will do. And then let's come back and explore this full significance here. I think that the the second half helps define what's going on the first half. Okay. That this is an entreaty here. Then we have a this is like a progression. And then this is a this is an entreaty to let man to do something. Okay. The action, of course, is let them have dominion. So this is uh this is an action. And the actor is now. <laughs> oh my goodness. So going back to our pronouns, our pronoun discussion. Okay, let us make man. So I'm gonna look at the Hebrew just to confirm this. Okay. So this is the the actors, but I, I hope everyone can see everyone can see what's going on here. So let's just let's just come back up to let's come back to Genesis 1 26. So man is so everyone can see. So you you can see my 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 um, my clicker on the left side. God said, "Let us let us make." So there's the plural. Let us make man. So man here, Adam. You can see at the bottom. Let me let me bring this up at the bottom of the screen. Everyone can see it's a noun, common singular, masculine. Right? Adam is is singular. Okay, everyone sees that. Let them. Let so look at this. So this is man singular. Let them have dominion. Plural. Do you see that? Man is singular. Let them have dominion. Plural. So even though man is singular, this is not. This is not. Who's being? Who's being implied here in the them? Adam and Eve. Yeah, male and female. Does everyone see that? So we're going to look at this more and more, and we're going to see this later on. This also helps define. Made in our image is, is male and female. So the true image of God isn't even just man or woman. The true image of God is male and female. Does everyone see that? See how powerful that is? We're going to come back and we're going to come back. And when, when God actually acts, we're going to confirm that. Okay. At this point, I'm just drawing your attention to the fact that it's male and female. Okay. They're going to have dominion. Dominion here, the the word actually is the, the word is rule or tread. Does everyone know what the word tread means? There, there's a fitness machine where this comes from. Treading wheel. Yeah, a treadmill. It's yeah. You're, you're walking. Walking over. Let them have dominion. Let them have rule. And this idea of rule is this idea of, of, of treading, walking, walking over, okay? This, this brings whole new meaning, and we're going to see this later, to Ephesians 1, 19 to 23. Put all things under Christ's feet. Do you remember that passage? Psalms 8. Does everyone remember that passage? Putting all things under the feet of Christ. It's literally going back to this imagery of, of ruling, of treading, of walking. When something is under the foot, you are you're exercising lordship over it. Okay. So let's just let's just pause and leave that idea here. We'll come back to it. But at this point, I really want to accent this idea of rule. So let them rule. And then what are they ruling over? So we have we have several objects here. So this is um a subordination. One, two, three, 
four, five. So they're they are they're having they are ruling over. So this is subordination, or we could say the object, the object of their rule. Okay. Now we could do all the different nuances here and we could spend all the time, you know, unpacking what this means. Essentially, what's going on here, though, this is a this is what's referred to as a merism or a or a figure of speech. And this is stating the parts to signify the whole. So, so what are these a part of? What's one word? These are all a part of one word or concept. What's the, what's the big word that all of these point to? D okay, yeah, dominion. But I'm saying, like, what's the concept that each one of these point to? That's that's happening here. Adam is ex exercising dominion, but what the fish, the birds, the livestock? Just looking all at the creations. yeah, all of creation. Excellent, excellent, all of creation. All of creation. Um, and this might be far from what we're what we're talking and what we're trying to yeah. to discuss here. But it's a thought um, while you were discussing earlier that this points to Christ eventually. So with that, um, Christ is presented here, or Jesus is presented here, more on uh, being the perfect man. Because you don't have to be a God, for example, here for Adam, to be ruling all creations. Because in the first place, creations were subjected to Adam. And so when, when, when this was applied to Christ, Hebrews, yeah. then we are, we are seeing it more of the angle that Christ is presented as the perfect man. That's a, good, that's a great observation. And so this is, this is Christ's humanity. Is being accented. So even thinking about Christ exercising lordship when he commands the winds and the sea to, to cease, a hundred percent that the accent is the lordship, the son of God. But there's also this humanity as well. <laughs> Beautiful, phenomenal observation, Pastor Enting. Phenomenal. Really good. So now that we have the focus. Okay. So we have to see the image relating fundamentally to this. Okay. So, so what is an image? So let's, let's write some things out here. An image is a representation of the original. It's not the original. It's a representation of it, okay? And it's visible, okay? So what does it mean to be in the image of God? And what I would say is it's a visible representation of, of man was meant to reflect God, be a visible representation of who God is, okay? And fundamentally, it's in this area of, of lordship, okay? So people will just talk about intellect or just in community, but, but fundamentally it's, 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 it's in lordship. And so what does all of this entail? So we're, we're bringing all these together. This includes, this includes community, right? Male and female. This includes intellect. The, the ability, the, the ability to, to reason. But it's not any, it's not, if he's going to be exercising lordship, it's reason in the context of, of God's knowledge, right? So he has to have in him, in his creation, the knowledge of God. What is it? What's included in the knowledge of God? God's moral law. And, and so this, where is this? This is, this is in the heart of man. And that's what, that's what Paul says in Romans 2. If, if man is representing God, he has to have his morality, right? <laughs> How can he exercise lordship if he doesn't have the law of God? And notice that, so you have community, you have reason, you have knowledge of God, morality, law. He has to have righteousness then and also holiness. 
Now, this is not perfect and this isn't confirmed, but he has to be in a state of these things if he's going to represent God. And if he's representing God, he's not representing himself. So he is still under, he's still under God's lordship. And if he's representing God, he's an ambassador in relationship. Is everyone tracking there? <laughs> yeah, so let's add, add here. Let's, let's also add here. He also has the ability to obey God. He also has to have, in some sense, immor immortal, immortal souls. Not that he has life in himself, but he has life given to him through God, from God. Okay? And this is male and female. And this mirrors, I would argue, the, the Trinity. Again, let me just be as clear as possible. I am not saying that Adam and Eve are gods, okay? They, they are analogous to and created in the image of God, but they themselves are not gods, okay? But this is, th so this is what it means to be in the image of God. Let's ask a question, make a comment. Is everyone tracking there with me? I think those are three. So I love the seed form analogy. That's from biblical theology. I love that ending. Thinking of it as a prototype and also thinking of it as, as a foundation. These are foundational. And then you can't see the foundation. You can see the effects of a foundation, right? Foundation lays the blueprint for how the building's going to be built, right? Where the wall is going to go, where, where the electric's going in and out, right? All those different things. So excellent point, Enting. I really appreciate that. And so the, we need to be thinking like this as we work through here. So I just use prototype there, but we can also use the word type. Yeah. Prototype is first type. Yeah. And then Christ would be the anti-type, the climax. Excellent. Yeah. So, so the big idea here is that, so let's just be, let's just summarize this. Okay. Adam has to have everything in order to, the, big, big idea here. Okay. Adam is God's visible representative to exercise God's will on earth. Big idea. And so, yeah, so let's look at, let's look, let's, let's, let's move on here now. Okay. So that's where we're at. So, so at this point here, we can say this right here is at this point, this is the plan, right? It hasn't happened yet. They're planning. Okay. So we're going to move from word to act to blessing, uh, you know, so anyway, so let's go on here now. So coming down to Genesis one twenty seven. Okay. We're going from, from word to, so God action created man. In his own image. So this is the, the comparison. In the image of man, in the image of God. Oops. So right now, just to be clear, we're looking at parallelism and we're going to see how powerful this is in a second. So let's just. These are parallel ideas. Okay. So we have. Action. 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 So we have, so God created man in his own image, in the image of God. He created him. Male and female, he created them. Look at this now, okay? I'm just going to look at the parallel that's going on here, okay? So you have created, created. God, he, he, man, him, them, his image, his image, male and female. This is the, the slap in the face. Okay. Woman was never a help me just to be the assistant. <laughs> so I had the joke on Tuesday night. There's a comedy in the U.S. There's an office comedy. Maybe some of you have heard of The Office, Michael Scott. 
if you've heard of it. And so there's Dwight Schrute is uh, he's this overzealous, ambitious worker. And so he was designated assistant to the regional manager, right? Assistant to the regional manager. So he's, and he's always calling himself the assistant regional manager. And the, and the manager's like, no, you're not, an, you're not the assistant regional manager. You're assistant to the regional manager, right? So the whole idea there is that Dwight wants the power of being like the vice, the vice manager. And he's like, no, 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 you're just my assistant. <laughs> and so here, a terrible translation of what man has been doing for centuries and, and millennia is my wife's just my assistant. She's just there to make me get so I can do what I need to do. But that's not what happens here. Fundamental to the image of God is male and female. So let me be as clear as possible. Coming back to, to this idea and to this idea, May, being made in the image of God, females complete males. Now, the Lord has given some of us singlehood. Some of us are single because of the corruption of the fall, because of the calling of God. Let the one who receives it receive it. Fair enough. But the plan, the plan is marriage. We, we, we reflect the image of God in the marriage relationship, male and female. Our wives are our queens. If the man is the king, the wife is the queen. Both of us exercise lordship and authority, and you as the king better be listening to your wife. <laughs> the wisest kings are the ones that listen to their wise wives, their wives' queen, their, their wise queens. And so this is maybe something new that you hadn't seen before. This this hit me like a like a brick wall. Our wives in Genesis 2, God will say that they're a helper, a helper fit for the man, but they're a help meet, and it includes the dominion, especially if this is the theological, and then you had the details in Genesis 2, okay? Even stronger, okay? This is the this is the theological that then explains Genesis 2. So the wives are not just helpers. They are queens. They exercise rule and authority just like we do. Notice here now, the big idea here is this idea of, huge idea here is the idea of Dominion mandate, or we can say kingdom mandate, okay? Now, that's going to be further spelled out in here, okay? But the big idea there is, is kingdom dominion mandate. And so this fundamentally, does it not contain government? Fundamentally, rule to rule. So you can talk about, you know, the granting of some form of, of government and the dispensational fine, you know, we'll just leave it to them. But fundamentally, the first government is fundamentally here given to Adam to rule over creation. Is everyone tracking there with me? Really good, really powerful. So I don't think Eric is here, but Eric's question was about how does covenant relate to kingdom? I've gone back and forth in this context Covenant is over kingdom. Kingdom is given through the covenant. So the more fundamental structure, now I, we still have to discuss God's e eternal kingdom and the sovereignty of God. And so that doesn't get at overall looking at the grand two concepts of kingdom and covenant. But in this context, at the beginning of time, through the covenant, kingdom is given. Does everyone see covenant is more, covenant is the relationship. Kingdom is the specific mandate. Everyone's tracking there with me? So, so let me just track with what you're saying. So you're saying that God's reign, which is over this, is then through his covenant, he, he rules and reigns his, his subjects as well. So that's why there's interplay. And so in one sense, the concept of kingdom is over covenant because God reigns over all. The relationship is through covenant, but then he's also, there is also kingdom and rule being given for us. And so then we also exercise that. So I think Meredith Klein and others will use vice regent. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So excellent, excellent clarification there. It all just depends on the context. <laughs> okay, let's go ahead. Let's, let's move on now. Let's move on to, to Genesis 1, 28. So we've moved from, we moved from the plan to big idea here is the, the act. So this is going from plan to action. So God acts 
And notice here now, this is not salvific grace, but <laughs> let's be thinking about the idea, uh, the concept of grace. How gracious is this? How gracious is this type of setup here? Creating someone, planning someone, and giving them lordship over all that you've done. That is phenomenal grace. You think if you've created something and then you give the authority to someone else, entrust it to them, my goodness. Next level grace right here. Okay, let's come down here. Look at what God does. So God not only plans, he, he creates, and then look at this here. God bless them. So coming back here to our handy dandy component sheet, we have, look at this here. So parties, parte, parties. God is God. Adam is his people, right? Creation. And we, we also have now a blessing, a general blessing that's being granted here. So God bless them. And God says to them, so we're moving now from, from blessing to, uh, this, is a, this is a benediction, right? This is a, let's write this down here, benediction. And then we have a, let's hold, what type of relationship is this going to be here, okay? Let us, so look at your assignments now, look at your, your breakout session group questions. What are all the commands? Let's list the commands. Someone someone, call, start calling out for me. I want all the commands from here until the end. Call them out for me. Label all the commands. So here we go. Command number one, be fruitful. What else? Multiply, seal, subdue. Multiply, fill, right? And so there's there seems to be one set of commands there. Then we have subdue. Number four, this is a command, right? Have dominion. So that's number five. You shall have them for food, right? This is also a command. So we have really, we have six commands. We're going to come back to this 29 in a second. Okay. So, so there's, uh, so we can say here, this is a commissioning, right? He's being commissioned. I should say they are being commissioned, okay? So so now you you have we have parties, we have blessing, we have commandment, promises, kingdom. He's giving them in, in many senses land, right? He's <laughs> he's giving them authority over everything. And so here the object so there is this this filling, then there's this subduing of the fish, the birds, and over every living thing. So this is all creation. So let's briefly look at each command specifically now. Okay. So wh what I want to say is that this is the general command, and now we're going to go into specific details. Be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. Okay. So this is, pe many people will say this is the the procreation mandate. What word do you what word do you see in procreation mandate that sounds like something that God does? Does everyone see that word create in there? Procreation? Just like God, right? So God, God creates his creatures. He gives to man, and then he, he also commands man to procreate. And the only way that man procreates is with his wife. Do you see that? So this is the procreation mandate in which man, male and female, are to fill the earth with other images of God. So this is, this is the, the filling of earth with God's representatives. Visible. So, I mean, this is so powerful. And may Adam botched it all. And now in Christ, the new creation, think about this. 
Christ, we are going to reign with Christ again. We are, we will reign, right? If we suffer, we will reign with him. So this is just, this is just fulfilling. Christ is just fulfilling what was originally commanded to Adam and Eve, right? To fill the earth. And of course, now it's not physical seed because man can't do it, right? We're all sinners. We're, we're, the image of God is marred. But here, man is commanded to fill the earth. So think about this. If you're filling the earth with God representatives, what's implied here? Obviously, children. But what's being implied? If you're filling, if you're filling with image with images of God. What's 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 implied here? What's what's a, a function that will later be spelled out in the Davidic in the in the Mosaic covenant? What what's the fundamental thing that we ought to do to children? Concerning the law of God. Teaching them to obey. Teaching, exactly. Or, <laughs> or, or pass over the mandate. <laughs> Does everyone see what's going on here? So when we talk about the procreation, the procreation mandate, it's almost just like, go have sex to have kids, right? I mean, that, that that's what you just think. You're just like, ah, oh, what? This is family family imagery, and so we could say family mandate. Is everyone tracking there? So again, you're, you're saying, Tim, maybe you're reading too much in. I don't think I am. This is, this is connecting with the image of God, what it means, and we're going to see how dominion. And so Adam has to teach his children what it means to be. Of course, they also have it in their hearts, but he has to teach his family what it means to be in the image of God. He has to teach them how to have dominion over, over, over the creation. And what's most important here is that this is the foundation for the family institution, okay? So we could say procreation mandate, family, the family mandate, or we could say the family institution. Subdue. Subdue is also contains the idea of treading with the feet as well. And this is ruling. So there is a nuance here. I would say this is the, the, the bringing of creation into subjection, right? So this is the, this would, if we could think about this, this is power. There's power required to bring creation into, into subjection. And then ruling is the authority. Okay. Is everyone tracking there with me? So the big idea here is in Genesis 1, 2, and 3, what specifically should have been subdued? Subdue, so subdue is a very violent term. So subdue is, if we look here at subdue, we come down here um, to subdue. The word is, it's that of like, it's like a submission to actually it's used in rape. So it's a very strong word. It's to bring something into subjection. Okay. <laughs> Christ is bringing stuff into subjection, baby. Okay, all right. Let, hold on, Christ. Okay, here in, is not this should not of of Adam crush the serpent's head when the serpent rose up and said, "Did God really say that?" Adam should be like, "You are not submitting to the Lord Lordship of God. and just take him out right there." He should have just stomped on the on the serpent's head like you are rising up against. God, Almighty God, you see what I'm saying? Like, that's I, 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 I really believe here that this, this convey this, this power against those creatures that might potentially uh, rise up, and you have that being seen in in the serpent, the serpent probably being possessed by Satan, but Adam should have crushed the serpent's head, and so when we think about crushing of the serpent's head. This comes back to the Genesis mandate, Genesis 1 of subduing, treading. So this has massive connections with Genesis 3.15. Ultimately, then, what Christ will do and his church, right? Paul says in, in Romans 16, soon, soon, so Satan's head will be, hold on, let's go to, uh, let's go to Romans uh, 16. Where is Romans 16? Um, Paul says this. Oh my goodness. Where is this at? Paul says, yeah, Paul, uh, Romans, 
20, uh, 1620. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. So this, this comes all this, this even finds its origin. And so really, this is why, this is why you have Robertson saying it's just one covenant through. I still maintain the covenant works, but Robertson's point is very well taken. And I want to have it both ways. I, I see both. I see both going on here. So <laughs> everyone's, everyone's tracking with me. And if it's beyond, uh, it's over your head, it's okay. I, I was just looking at, at that word subdue. And yeah, I think you are referencing or uh, looking forward to Genesis chapter three, where the garden and all the creations were subjected to Adam. Then he had a power. It was his, it was his rule, a role. It was his role to protect the garden and and uh, rule over it yeah. in a way that is honoring and glorifying to God. But looking at it, the serpent being part of that creation yeah. under him, yeah. he has authority over it. Yeah. But in terms of Satan, because Satan was using the, the serpent, yeah. he can command the serpent and yeah. he can let the serpent leave. Because he is trying to destroy the creation of God, but mm. in terms of Satan, was Satan subjected to Adam? No, phenomenal question, Enting. And I would say that I'm shooting from the hip. So I've said this before. I'm shooting from the hip. I could miss. I want to. I want. I want to say that Ezekiel 28 or Isaiah 14. Satan is is like the is 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 the most powerful. So they're in the spiritual realm, not the physical realm. And so all of creation is in the physical realm. And I think this focus here is on the physical realm. And so regardless of whether or not Adam had authority over Satan, we have to think about that. Maybe it maybe uh, may, let me think about that. Regardless, it's it's he's using the serpent. So he's using the physical creation. So you're right that Adam has the right to kill the serpent. He won't kill Satan, but he'll kill the serpent. And that'll end the conversation. <laughs> yeah, I think I think that's very fair. I think that's very fair. But regardless, ending, regardless, Christ comes, he's above Satan and serpent. He's above all. And I think that's next level. That's next level in, in Ephesians, in Ephesians chapter one. So powerful. Let's move on here now. So Genesis 12. 29, uh, Genesis 29. So then God says, so then look at this here. Look at the, look at the generosity and the grace. Behold, I have given to you all plants and every tree. So this is the, so think about this. So this is act, blessing, Stipulations. This is provision, <laughs> right? So God not only gives the stipulations, he also provides for all of his creation and especially man. Does everyone see that? And then he gives them the command of what they are to eat. You shall have them for food. So this is, a, this is the most gracious God. He's given Adam and Eve everything. So think about this. There, there's also, in giving commands, is there not also knowledge here? Is everyone tracking? So there's, there's, there's a not, knowledge of conscience in the, in the heart of man. The heart, the law is given. But there's also this knowledge, or we could say revelation, that's being given to man as well. So specifically, God's will, okay? Is everyone tracking there with me? So, so God is revealing to man his will for him here, direct communication. And it was so, and God, and God saw that he, everything he made, behold, it was good. The evening and the morning were the sixth day. So, so here really is the, is the big takeaways here, okay? So we have government institution we have the family mandate and and so then chapter two is just an expansion of all of this okay 
The last thing before we go on here is I want to also include is with the dominion motif, you also have the religious institution created. And this is going to be further unpacked in chapter two, okay? And so what, what, when I'm saying religious, I'm saying God communicating with man, man communicating with God. And then mediating for creation. Is everyone tracking there? That's, that's, that's essentially the religious experience, right? And so this, we have fundamentally a relationship, right? So what I'm trying to get at here is we have the three fundamental institutions. Um, and then probably the fourth, which is implied, is, is also the conscious, uh, conscience. This is from Image of God. So is everyone tracking? Is everyone is everyone tracking here with me? So we have we, the over the overarching mandate is the is the kingdom mandate. Within the kingdom mandate, you have the family mandate that includes marriage, procreation, training of the kids. You have the subduing and ruling over all of creation. So this would also include the religious institution. God, man is imposing God's will upon the creation as his representative. Man is also mediating for creation and his family. He, uh, Adam is, is, is mediating, speaking to God. God is speaking to him. He's in relationship. And then there's also this, in, what it means to be in the image of God is the conscience that there is this internal speaking, uh, internal existence of law. God's law is written on the heart of man. Is everyone tracking there with me? Let's ask a question if, you, if, you're, if you're not, un, if you're unsure. Is everyone tracking there with me? I just want to finish G Genesis. So um, just really briefly here. So we have the heavens and the earth were finished and all the hosts of them. And so God finished his work description which he had done there's a description here and so then he rests on the seventh day and so now what we're, what we're entering into the mandate here is the the big idea here is the work rest mandate and we're going to look at this throughout this course but here what we're seeing is that this work rest mandate, God is patterning for us, and no one really in Baptist circles respects this, right? We will work seven days a week, and our worship day is like double work, double work. There is this mandate. So look at what happened. So God rests on the seventh day from all the work which he had done. And so this is a separation here. And watch this. So look, look at what God does. God blesses the seventh day and makes it holy. So, and then this is the basis here. This is the basis. Because, it, because on it, God rested from all the work that he had done in creation. And so this is the big takeaway. In creation... God sets up this work rest mandate, a pattern for us to follow. We will follow the family mandate. Maybe we'll follow the, the dominion mandate part of it. But when it comes to work rest, we don't follow it. And so our, our Sundays are more work <laughs> than oftentimes than rest and we never rest. So let's think about this for a second. Maybe I'll ask the question. How have you failed to keep this mandate? What are your thoughts? What are your thoughts on that? Uh, from our from my previous church, when when they say you have to rest, or or in respect of the Sabbath, you rest in the church. So by working, you rest in the presence of God. So that's the uh, that's the definition from our previous church. How would you deal with that? From our previous church, when they say. Uh, for the rest day or the Sabbath is 
Sunday, you have to work for God. And that work for God, the whole day is your rest. Even though you you, you literally work, that literally rest. How would you deal with that? Is it uh, physically rest? Like as in you, you, you do nothing but admire the work of God, your work to, throughout six days of the week, or do you do something for God? So, so Sabbath, seventh day, the word is Sabbath. And this means rest or cease. Cease to stop, to stop. And so I would say any work that you do, work, work, work is effort. And when you're called to, to cease and you have still work to be done, there is a trusting component. No, I'm going to rest. I'm going to, to, to take a break. I'm going to cease from my labor one in seven days. And so I would say that that's, I would, I would just shooting from the hip, that church that you attended was, was making a loophole to burden you with more work. <laughs> During the Sabbath, what would you do? As in, yeah. if you have nothing to do, you have nothing to labor for. Yeah. But what did the, the Jews did before? Yeah, so, so they had a whole system in their tradition. And so they had excuses as well to get, to get around, to do what they were going to do. They had loopholes. The whole point of Sabbath is this. It's, it's a holy day for us to reflect upon and to enjoy what, what God, God's perfect. He doesn't need to rest. He's, he's God. He's infinite. He doesn't need to rest. But he set up this pattern. He worked and then he rested on the seventh day to reflect upon what he had done. Okay. And that was a pattern for us, for us to, to set aside one day to reflect upon the work of God. And so in the church, and this is in Presbyterians too, I, I, you know, I'm uh, more in Presbyterian circles. And so they'll say, yeah, no physical work, but you can, you can care for, 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 for the, for the sick. You can deal spiritual, spiritual work. And, and, and the confession will talk about that. And the whole point is that, you know, Jesus said that he's the Lord of the Sabbath and you can do good. And so there is a truth there that you can do good, but we've turned it into another work day. It's just a spiritual work day. And I, I, you know, my church, my old church in the U S literally, I, I was, I was a pastoral intern. I had to be there at eight 30 for meetings. We prayed and had a de- meetings for the day. We had Sunday, we had uh, Sunday school from nine 15 to 10 30 morning worship from 10 30 till 12. I had to stay there until one o'clock till everyone left. Then we came back for four 45 PM for choir practice. Then we had evening worship service and I didn't get home till eight 30 at night. And so you did all of this work. I actually worked more on that day than I did at my regular job for, for one day. And you, you want to know something? I was, I was breaking God's law. And so Voss will actually talk, Gerhardus Voss will actually talk in biblical theology that our worship services have become a work day and it's actually blasphemous for a day of rest. And so I think if you were to say, what would I do on a, on a Sabbath day? We can talk about the transition from Saturday to Sunday. What we can talk about the transition from Saturday to Sunday. What we can't talk about is no Sabbath. Okay. So some people are like, oh no, it's all fulfilled. It's all done away. It's like, no, <laughs> This is no, we can talk about Saturday or Sunday fine, but there the, the mandate is is as long as creation is there, the mandate's there. And if you don't rest, God will take your life. And I've seen pastors that have taken their life, God has taken their life because they haven't rested. God will take God will take that Sabbath one way or another. He will take it. <laughs> I've seen it. Pastors who committed suicide, they were workaholics. I'm thinking of an example, someone that I know committed suicide. They, they said there was other factors. Fair enough. But I found out his schedule even from 20 years ago. And it was, it was like insane, insane work. I'm like, no, this guy t- committed suicide because of, of the stress. And so this is why I'd say, Clay, our worship services, we should, ha- we should worship on Sunday, but they should not be so big that we're working and we should still exercise rest. So this is for like what we do for church. We have a morning worship service. We go there, we leave, we, we wake up, we relax. We leave around like maybe 9, 15, 9, 30. 
We have morning service. We leave by 12.30. I take a leisurely lunch. We come home. We relax. We rest. Nothing in the evening. The, the church has a, another Bible study in the evening. No. I'm going to rest. <laughs> so I would say that, and I don't know what Cruciform Life Church does, and I'm not, there's no judgment. Everyone has difference, and even the church I'm attending now, they have all this stuff. Um, but But I think that we should have worship, reflect upon who God is. If there's an emergency or something needs to be done, you should do good. But you should, as a pattern, take Sunday as a rest day. And if you're a leader or full-time pastor, you should take another day as rest. That that's that's my that's my perspective. And I think this is the this is the mandate. And here's the thing: if we acknowledge the mandates for kingdom, for family, for subduing, for lordship, for obviously the the eating, some of this stuff ch changes in Noahic, right? The Noahic covenant. But if we have these mandates, this also applies. This also applies. Okay, so um, let's let's close on this. We have some more covenantal terminology. So let me just highlight here. So let's just come back. Through, let's just end end this on this. So we have resting is a theme in Mosaic covenant, and so. Whether you want to accept it or not, you say, oh, no, whatever. Sabbath was a sign. It was a, it was a sign in the Old Covenant. Sabbath is a, a covenantal term. Okay, you, you can reject it. Fine. I don't agree with you. I'm, I may be speaking to our YouTube, our YouTube people. So we have sat, the seventh day, which is Sabbath. Holy. Holy is a covenantal term. Coming back up to here in Genesis 1.26, we have... The commands here. We have the, the blessing. And then we have the parties. So not everything is here, but many of them are here. Okay. And so we clearly have, we clearly have, we could also add this grace idea here. We could also add this grace idea here. So we have a lot of different components going on. We're going to see more components next chapter. Okay. Okay. So I would, I would just want to say is that this is foundational. This is a covenantal framework that we're looking at. And it makes perfect sense that this is the, the, the covenant of, of work. You know, this is the, the general, I want to say covenant of creation, my goodness, you know, but there is this covenant relationship going on. Big takeaway. Any comments or questions before we close in prayer? Is everyone tracking there? Is, is there any confusion or everyone's really tracking with that? Any comments or questions? Um, regarding the covenant of works, I have read Stephen Myers, and the question is, why then did God make the covenant of works when he knew, he knows that Adam and Eve would fall? Yeah, so I would, I would say that there, there's a greater plan that, that God has in mind. There has to be some greater plan going on that would have made creation in the garden, not the end. So let's think for a second. What are some greater things that we have that's greater than just Adam and Eve living in the garden? What are some greater things that redemption actually gives us? What do you have now in your heart? And the Holy Spirit cries during the life. Yes. Yeah, so we have, we have the Holy Spirit, God dwelling in us. In the garden, Adam did not have the Holy Spirit dwelling in him. So that was a benefit post-fall covenant of grace. So God has to create. He knows that Adam's going to fall, but he has a greater purpose in mind. Number one, God's spirit next level, right? There's a, there's a higher level. And so Voss will actually talk about this, that there's, so here's the big takeaway. Okay. So let's, let's think about this. So I, I want to be short. We need it. We need to end here, but okay. So what we're, we're thinking about what people all, often say is that, you can imagine this is this is a uh, creation old new creation this is time okay and so people are just saying you have the creation event this is the this is eden and so then there's just time and we and and we're coming back eden to eden that's what people will talk about that, that this is a this is a bad analogy okay so we're we're talking about eden 
to so <laughs> next level okay G god will come down and dwell in fellowship in eden but with the heavenly new jerusalem the holy spirit is in us christ is a man god is man leading us and in the heavenly new jerusalem his throne is going to be among us and the only way we're going to get there is by his spirit filling us and his son living among us the lamb and so i don't know all of god's reasons i would say those are some pretty good reasons why god allowed adam to fall and he has a much greater purpose in, in, in mind we're not going back to eden we're going on to the heavenly jerusalem big takeaway next level <laughs>